Hey guys, it's Poe back again with Let's Get Techie. Uh, today is our part two follow-up video uh, on the small form factor Ryzen build that we did last week. Um, so I just want to start out by pointing out the obvious in case you guys see it later in the video. I uh, got into a fight with an Oompa Loompa. Um, no, no, that's not what happened. I got one of Epson's uh, Eco Tank printers, which come with bottles of ink that you fill uh, tanks with, hence the name EcoTank. Um, made it through the first three totally fine. Um, on the fourth one, uh, which was the yellow color, uh, it attacked me. So if I do any hand talking and have my hands in the air throughout the video, then um, I just wanted to point that out up front. Uh, for all of you people who love to chit chat in the comment section about oddities from within the video. Uh, but again, today we are going to go over the performance of the HTPC that we built, as well as some of the issues that I had getting it up and going. So the first one, um, I'm sure many of you, if not all of you, had heard about the issues that um, X570 and the new Radeon 5700 class of cards were having when you used riser cables. Well, it's no shocker that the Shift X does use a riser cable. Um, I believe, in fact, it's a Generation 2, but that's beside the point. Um, we were told that if you were running an X570 board with one of the new um, PCIe 4.0 video cards from AMD, uh, that the riser cable would stick you in 2D mode. Well, for our build last week, we used an, what was it? It was a B450 board. Um, so I wasn't expecting to have any issues. Once I got it up and running, um, it was getting incredibly low frame rates in Unigen superposition. And was also um, getting some freezing here and there and some crashing back out to the desktop. Uh, took me a while to figure it out, but um, <clears throat> if you remember right when um, X570 was first announced and being talked about, uh, a few of the board manufacturers actually said that they were going to retroactively support uh, PCIe 4.0 on the older motherboards. And Asus was one of the ones to come out and say that, and then I guess AMD nixed that. Um, they said for... Um, they wanted it to be a, a more streamlined solution and they didn't want there to be issues um, and people complaining about it and they were concerned that some of the older boards uh, might have some signal quality issues and it just wouldn't be an overall good experience. Um, so they said, hey, no, we're not going to do this. Um, but uh, depending on what BIOS version you're running and what motherboard you're running, uh, apparently they will still support PCIe 4.0, and that's exactly what was happening with this B450 board that we used uh, for the HTPC. So it took me a little bit to figure it out and went and looked in Wattman and noticed that the clock speed was not anywhere near what it should be. Uh, I had that Eureka moment and popped into the BIOS and changed it from auto setting on the BI16 slot to uh, Gen 3 booted back up, no more issues with that. So that took me, it was a minimal amount of time compared to the other issues that I had, but let's just say 10 minutes. And moving right along to our second issue, it also happens to be our second issue related to the GPU. Um, so this one was causing blue screen crashes. Uh, initially, it looked like maybe some instability with a component. Um, I had tweaked around with the CPU a little bit. I had bumped up the memory, and I just began uh, overclocking on the video card. Uh, so I'm thinking, okay, this is a, a blue screen that is uh, related to the video um, that was known by the specific blue screen that it was. Um, so went ahead and reset defaults in the BIOS and took away my overclock on the GPU as well. It continued and it was sporadic. Um, so it worked good for a little bit, stopped working. Um, had no idea what to do with this, so I ended up talking to good old Mr. Google. Um, he pointed me in the direction of uh, good old Mr. Reddit 
and found a post on Reddit, um, very obscure. Uh, the, the fix for this just baffled me. They were having the exact same blue screen. It was also a Ryzen 3600 and a 5700 GPU. And his fix for this was rolling back to the previous driver, which isn't unheard of. That, that seems reasonable. And also, for whatever reason, changing it from 8-bit to 6-bit, which I even had trouble finding within Wattman. So, uh, had it not been for this other individual that had this exact same issue, uh, I probably never would have figured that one out. The next two issues move away from the GPU and move to the OS. Uh, so, as many of you uh, share my affinity and hatred for Windows 10, I love it. It's a great operating system, and at the same time, I absolutely hate it. So, initially, I had issues getting Windows activated. Um, to be fair, I was using a gray market key that so many people do use, uh, but that wasn't the problem. It wasn't not taking the key. It just flat out was not allowing me to go into the activation screen at all. Once I would go into settings and then click activation to bring up the activation window, uh, the entire window would just crash out and splash me back out to the desktop. Um, so for a little while I messed with that and then I moved on and said, hey, if I can't get it activated, at least I can finish the testing that I need to do uh, for the video and then I can go back and tackle the activation later. Uh, so I started installing programs, started downloading things, and um, extractions were freezing at 99%. They were fine until they hit 99% and then they would freeze. Now initially I could still do things in the background um, with the frozen extraction there on screen. Uh, go to Chrome or whatever. Um, it was still allowing me to do background tasks. And uh, the longer I waited and the more I tried to extract again, I started getting um, <clears throat> freezes and crashes from within Chrome and um, also some blue screens. So I'm thinking we've got activation issues and now we're freezing and the freezing started with extractions and uh, Windows Explorer also froze. Uh, so I'm, I'm starting now to think, hey, maybe we've got an SSD issue. Turns out it was a full-blown corrupt install of Windows. Uh, once I reinstalled Windows, no more freezing issues, I could extract anything I wanted, and I was able to actually access the activation window. And the last of my issues uh, with this build, we're all going to uh, lump them together uh, as just build issues. And again, this was no fault of the hardware. Uh, it's just, it comes with the territory doing small form factor builds and especially liquid cooled fo small form factor builds. Um, so one of the things was is the uh, Lang DDC pump that we chose to go within the uh, Fantex reservoir to actually get that uh, pump inserted and get the cover plate back installed on the back. I did have to Dremel the plastic mount ears off of the backside housing of the pump itself. No big deal. Um, just took up another, you know, 10 or 15 minutes. And luckily at this point, this was before I had all of the super frustrating uh, software related issues. Um, also, another one was the 24 pin being too short. And that's a common issue, again, with the Shift X case. Um, luckily, I did have some cable extensions uh, on hand that would work. We initially weren't planning on using extensions in the build, but uh, out of necessity, they ended up there nevertheless. Also, once I got everything in the computer, I was no longer able to fit the power supply shroud back over the cabling. Um, you guys can be the judge of that. I don't think it looks horrific. Yes, it would have been cleaner if we were able to put that shroud on it. Um, but to be able to do that with the reservoir that we had installed, we definitely would have had to do some dremeling to that power supply shroud. And um, although super easy and accessible and able to be done, I really did not want to destroy that power supply shroud um, if the owner of that case ever decided he wanted to do something different with it. And the last minuscule issue that I had was 
once I actually got the build up and running and booted for the first time, it was giving me a CPU fan speed warning. Uh, looked up, noticed that the fan that was connected to the CPU header was running slow, and in some situations on boot, it was barely spinning up at all without me helping it. Uh, of course, this was one of the fans that was uh, super hard to get to. It's the one right next to the motherboard, so you've just got to fedangle it in and out. Um, come to find out, nothing wrong with the fan at all. A zip tie that I had used for cabling uh, on the back side of where that fan is, once I put the side panel on the computer, it was actually pushing that zip tie into the hub of the fan and causing it to slow down and thus error out. And thankfully, that's going to do it for the issues that I had with the build, and now we can move right on to performance. To start off our performance testing, we went back to the tried and tested Cinebench R15. We tested stock as well as overclocked, although manual overclocking was basically non-existent on the chip. We instead opted to use Ryzen Master and turned on PBO as well as a plus 200 offset for the auto OC. With this enabled, our clock speed saw a very meager 40 MHz bump on average for lightly threaded workloads and virtually no distinguishable difference when all cores were loaded, and this shows in our results. Additionally, it's also worth noting that for overclocked results, we did also run our memory at the out-of-the-box DOCP setting of 3200 MHz CL16. At stock in Cinebench R15, we saw a single core score of 196, which falls very closely in line with something like a 7700K from Intel. Overclocked with PBO and the previously mentioned plus 200 offset, we saw the single core score increase by a massive two whole points to 198. Yes, you heard that right, two points. Moving on to the multi-core in R15, I hate to spoil it for you, but we saw much the same in the way of OC scaling. Our stock number was 1611, while our OC number was 1616. These numbers are most definitely margin of error territory. We would recommend just leaving the chip stock as it's not worth the extra power or temperature. Moving to the newer Cinebench R20, we left our measly OC enabled, if you can actually call it that, and scored 479 points in single core and 3580 in multi core. Again, you can see that this chip's single core performance is basically on par with a 7700K. Some may take this as a negative, but honestly, we think that this is pretty darn good and give AMD a thumbs up for the IPC improvement in Zen 2. Next up is ASUS RealBench. Not a ton of people use this test much anymore, but we still like it, even if it is just because we enjoy the music during the video playback portion. In RealBench, we saw an image editing score of 171,463. Something we have noticed in the past is that occasionally RealBench will struggle to begin the image editing portion of the test, and when it does this, it negatively impacts the score. This is something that we've seen on both AMD and Intel chips. That being said, take this score with a grain of salt since we cannot explain why it behaves this way. In the encoding portion, we saw a score of 27419, followed by OpenCL testing for the GPU, which scored 83627. Don't worry, we did some dedicated GPU testing as well, so more on that in a bit. Heavy multitasking saw a score of 244,646, and the overall system score was 175,813. Our last performance testing for the CPU had us using Blender and the GoTo BMW render. We were able to complete the BMW render in 3 minutes and 44 seconds. Keep in mind, Blender as well as the demo work files are available for free, as are the rest of the programs we're using for CPU testing. So if you're interested in seeing how your current rig stacks up, we'll leave links in the description below for the programs that we used. Next, we take a look at some GPU performance. Luckily, our 5700 XT underwater very much enjoyed a core overclock unlike our CPU. That being said, the memory was an angry bunch of chips. We were only able to eke out a 900 MHz memory clock while we saw peak core clocks well in excess of 2.1 GHz and averages in the 2070 MHz range. First up is Firestrike Ultra. At stock, our graphics score was 6119. Once our overclock was applied, we saw a 6% uplift with a graphics score of 6493. 
Next, we tested Time Spy Extreme, which is a very graphically intensive workload. At stock, our graphic score was 3904, and after manipulating our sliders in Wattman, we saw a graphic score of 4089. Not bad at all, as this is a 4.8% uplift in performance. Our last GPU testing was done in Unigen's Superposition benchmark. We ran the 1080p Extreme test, which contrary to what most think is actually more graphically demanding than 4K optimized. At stock, we saw a score of 5139, and once overclocked, we saw our best results yet with a score of 5522, which is a 7.5% uplift in performance. Not bad at all for spending 30 minutes playing around in Wattman. Before you ask, I already know what your next question is. What were the temps? So for temperature testing, we decided to use ADA64 to stress our CPU and good old Furmark to give the GPU a workout. We did test both independently, as running both tests simultaneously would represent an unrealistic workload for a home theater PC. After letting our CPU heat soak, we saw a max T-dye temperature of 86C, while the average was slightly lower at 81C. One thing to keep in mind is that while these temperatures seem high, they are actually very respectable when compared to other Zen 2 chips under an ADA64 load. It's going to take some time before we get used to the new normal with these very toasty 7 nanometer chips from AMD. Next, we loaded up the furry donut and blasted our GPU for 12 minutes. AMD has decided with this release of GPUs that they are not only going to give us edge temperatures, which is what we're used to seeing, but also hotspot temperatures. If you confuse the two, it may lead you to think that you are utterly baking your new graphics card, as the max hotspot temp we saw was 104C. The max edge temp was a much more reasonable sounding 68C. Yes, you heard that right, 104C hotspot temp while custom liquid cooled. Again, this hotspot temp is not something most people are used to seeing, and that is why it seems global warmingly hot. So overall, even though we had so many issues getting the build up and running, I couldn't be happier with the end result, and my buddy Dexter, who actually owns the computer, was stoked to get it home and get it hooked up to that enormous projector that he has in his living room. Um, so make sure that if you have not checked out the part one of this video, uh, click the, I don't know where it's going to be, but click it and it will take you to part one if you have not already seen it. Also, make sure you take a look at the video before that one where we did the 3900X on chilled water. Um, that's going to do it for this one. Uh, let us know what you want to see in the upcoming videos. We're going to try to start making our uploads more regular again. Fingers crossed for that. Uh, hit that like button if you like this video and make sure you get subscribed if you are not already and we will see you in the next one